say that the United Kingdom has not had the most prosperous and stress-free few years. However, what could be on the verge of occurring will make the previous struggles pale in comparison. One of the most powerful nations in the history of the world is on the verge of collapse, and it deserves a deeper dive. Let's get into it. The United Kingdom is one of the most powerful nations in the world, and has been for multiple centuries. From the ruling monarchies of the past, to the political progression of parliamentary government, the UK has always been a huge player on the world stage. As a key ally to the United States, their success is America's success, both militarily as well as financially. In the wake of the 2020 global pandemic, the entire world experienced massive economic turmoil, with some nations still reeling from the effects, while others have been quicker to bounce back. The UK is, unfortunately, an example of a nation still trying to regain a foothold on its economy. And it seems that things could get much worse before they improve, if they ever do improve at all. The once leading and influencing nation of the world has seen struggle after economic struggle over the span of the past few years. And it seems that it's not set to improve drastically anytime soon. In a tumultuous year of 2022, that has already seen a prime minister and several high-ranking cabinet officials step down, extremely turbulent economic effects and the death of a queen, the nation is now facing a true test in the outcome of its future. The economy of the UK is at a boiling point, and with recent moves by the Bank of England signalling that things could be set to go from bad to worse, just how bad are things really? And even more importantly, how much worse can they get without risking the future relevance of the nation? The UK is now on the brink of economic disaster, and only time will tell if they can survive the test or not. Traditionally, the United Kingdom has boasted a strong and powerful economy, typically being one of the leading financial driving entities of the world. Known historically for their mercantilism and free trade activity, they've been an economic superpower for centuries throughout the history of the world. They've seen their economic output increase from around £200 billion in 1900 to close to £1.7 trillion in 2016. The flip-flop in power between the Conservative and Labour parties over the years has helped to strengthen their traditional economy overall. However, more turbulent times have occurred in the nation, as well as across Europe, since the 2008 global recession. During this time, the Bank of England instated its first quantitative easing policy, in which it bought back government bonds and injected over £200 billion back into the economy of the UK. At the time, the policy was speculated to be an experiment to provide immediate relief to the nation, However, the governor of the bank, Mervyn King, spoke out against these speculations, stating that it was not an experiment and was likely to be used in times of economic strife going forward. In the immediate years after, the UK's economy continued to shrink, having rolled back by close to 5% by 2009. The next few years were filled with minor ebbs and flows in progress and regression, with a pretty stagnant state of the economy staying true. However, in 2013, the nation began a cycle of steady, continued growth, seemingly ending the dark times and beginning a future brighter than ever before for the superpower. The rough conditions and dire outlooks of 2008 through 2011 had seemingly passed, and it seemed the UK was set for yet another economic bounce back to power. However, unfortunately, more problems laid ahead, including a stagnation of growth in both the overall economy and employment rates, the Brexit debacle that divided the nation and the world, and the current situation in the UK. On September 19th, 2022, the eyes of the world were securely fixated on Britain. As Queen Elizabeth II's funeral was held with the world as an audience, it was a somber time of mourning, with the utmost dignity permeating throughout all aspects of the ceremony. Juxtaposed against what followed the next Friday, when newly appointed Prime Minister Liz Truss and her finance minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, laid out their new tax and government spending plans, it would seem as the funeral was not quite as somber as what was to come. While the nation and the world grieved the loss of the Queen, the UK's newly instated Prime Minister and her cabinet had a plan in the works that they believed was set to reverse the nation's path and get them back on course for economic prosperity. Unfortunately, at least currently, it had quite the opposite effect. Upon the release of the updated tax plan, the financial markets in the United Kingdom set a fire, with the pound free falling to an all-time low against the US dollar. This sparked tumultuous global market movement, and great losses were seen around the globe. There was also a collapse in price for UK government bonds, and nearly caused a similar collapse of pension funds, which would have had absolutely devastating effects on the global economic markets. 
The International Monetary Fund, a United Nations agency that promotes and oversees financial cooperation in UN nations, broadly denounced the move and warned that sticking to the new miniaturized budget would indeed have irreversible effects on global economic markets and would facilitate further economic inequality within the UK. The United Kingdom is not alone, certainly not in Europe, in its current state of economic uncertainty. Most nations' financial markets are still experiencing reeling from the effects caused by the 2020 global pandemic. A calculated, careful approach is not just encouraged in the wake of such a large-scale economic downturn, but it is necessary. And while Truss's plan certainly has some good ideas, there are overarching ideals set to send the UK on a path to disaster. Quick fixes are nice at the moment, but when they threaten the very livelihood of one of the oldest, most valuable nations in the world, they are simply not worth enacting. The United Kingdom needs a full-scale cooperation between both the public and private sectors in investing in productivity-enhancing tech, as well as effective climate change solutions if the country is to come out on the other side of this downturn in one piece. The Trust Plan also included a cap on energy prices for both homes and businesses and removed any future increases to payroll or corporate taxes. Both of these provisions in tandem sent a massive shock to the economic system of the nation, both being extremely expensive decisions. But the outrageous spending didn't stop there. The plan also included additional income tax cuts, most of which favoured the most wealthy. These three components instantly caused UK debt to soar, and also sent the public's debt on a path that is highly unsustainable. Even worse, it seems that there was absolutely no oversight applied at all through the normal channels of checks and balances within the British parliamentary government. The Office of Budget Responsibility, or OBR, which is a completely politically independent entity designed to review and produce analysis and outlook on the government's financial decisions, has briefly studied the trust plan, but has not officially published any of their findings for the citizens to review. This is not a good sign, and likely means that the overall forecast from the plan's objectives are dim. Without independent studies to review the plan, the review process was handed over directly to the global financial markets, and the review was overwhelmingly negative. Nearly instantly, the value of UK government bonds were reduced to mere ash. This means higher mortgage repayments, which some see as a positive thing. But with that also came collapse of UK pension funds, which currently hold roughly $1 trillion in valuation. On the 28th of September, the Bank of England had no other choice than to reverse its quantitative tightening policy, which began to buy back these bonds in record numbers, roughly $65 billion, just to avoid a complete and utter financial disaster. This caused a spiralling effect, and by the next Monday, October 3rd, Truss had backtracked on her initial income tax bracket plan and decided against removing the UK's highest earning tax bracket. After all, the wealthiest taxes would now be necessary in keeping the United Kingdom afloat amongst unforeseen turmoil. But why? Why did Truss and her advisors believe that this plan would work and, more importantly, why didn't it? The rationale used is similar to that used by former US President Donald Trump when he made updates to the United States tax code in 2017. Similarly, his tax reform also placed an emphasis on cutting the tax rates of corporations and the most wealthy in an attempt to incorporate trickle-down economics into the US economy. The basic idea behind this is that those in the lower tax rate brackets will boost enough economic growth to offset the lack of tax revenue they are actually providing to the government. Thus, the plan would lead to the government's borrowing less and creating a positive impact on the nation's debt levels, eventually leading to great profit returns. The initial idea is taken from US economist Arthur Laffer, who advised Gerald Ford during his presidency. It's a good idea in theory. However, unfortunately, few serious economists in the 21st century agree that it's a strategy that is effective in unlocking economic upticks, especially in the UK market. What transpired immediately after the implementation of the Trust Plan would seem to support that notion. Although this is another economic disaster in Britain, similar to the 2016 Brexit ordeal, which led to a nearly 3% increase in cost of living in the UK, it is not unique. On the contrary, Europe as a whole is facing numerous political and financial issues. First and foremost, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has sent markets spiraling. With Europe being so heavily reliant on Russian oil and gas, the conflict has affected European countries more than others like, say, the United States, who have a robust reserve of gas and rely on Russian exports much less than European nations. Also, Europe has been remarkably slower at rebounding financially in the wake of the global pandemic than the United States. States, similar to the financial crisis of 2008. European countries are also dealing with a slowed productivity growth rate in the past five years as well. 
The UK has been hit particularly hard, meaning that wage growth has nearly stalled. While the trust plan may have missed the mark, it was at least correct in asserting that the UK, like much of the rest of Europe, is in desperate need of relief and an upturn in productivity and financial growth rates. Thirdly, political landscapes are shifting dramatically as a result of the economic turmoil. Voters are turning out in record numbers for fringe, populist candidates that are pushing quick return strategies, such as parties with platforms built on fascist undertones and roots. These fringe entities blame the issues on foreigners and elites, and offer solutions such as ramping up criminal immigration prosecutions. While these fringe parties may not have a place in the world that isn't seemingly on fire, in search of someone or something that can make any difference, these far-to-the-aisle ideologies are receiving more support than they likely would otherwise. Rather than embracing these ridiculous fringe ideologies, the UK and Europe as a whole need to double down on sensible, structural policy changes to those that have a goal of delivering a sustainable increase in productivity to the region. This includes reforming product markets, labour markets and financial markets, while also doubling down and honing in on skills, infrastructure and maybe most importantly, innovation. The most common sense way of achieving this is to focus on the purpose of the European Union's Recovery Fund, a post-COVID fund worth north of 800 billion euros. The fund was founded to assist in things like overhauling government services, making them more digitally available, ramping up clean energy implementation, and focusing and funding more scientific research. Each of these is proven to hold weight in the fight for increased productivity. While things are dire, there remains a sliver of hope on the horizon for the region. Europe still maintains its place as the world's largest market and continues to be a leader in both innovation and democracy. Education rates remain high and the nation's inequality levels are still lower than what is seen in similar nations such as the United States, for example, and European healthcare remains a bright spot in the region both in terms of access and cost. All of this means that, for now at least, Europe is still a leading market for many of the world's largest corporations. It also is seen as the standard-setting region in terms of policy directed towards mitigating and reversing climate change, with many other nations following in Europe's footsteps. But growth has slowed in Europe, and it's becoming less and less desirable, seemingly by the month. If this slowed growth trend continues, Europe risks losing its foothold in many categories which it is currently seen as a leader. Populism will likely grow as well, meaning more and more corporations will be looking to exit the market. Obviously, this would spell ultimate doom for Europe. So a common sense approach to ramp up the aforementioned priorities, productivity and financial growth being the most important, is of utmost importance in the immediate future. The United Kingdom is on the verge of an absolute collapse. What it, along with the rest of Europe, does next is critical in avoiding a complete meltdown. Kwasi Kwarteng, England's finance minister, has asserted that the government intends to trust their plan. However, he recently asserted that they are in the middle of an extremely narrow window to regain the trust of investors and prove that the government can be trusted with the nation's finances. With the Bank of England's bond buyback initiative set to end on October 14th, we may soon see just how devastating the plan will be on both the short-term and long-term sustainability of the nation. Liz Trust is in the middle of a rock and a hard place, needing to reassure the markets and their investors, as well as satisfying voters who are sick and tired of the exponential increase of their mortgage payments. Trust has stuck to her guns, stating that she still does not plan on abandoning the tax cuts she helped implement, as doing so would likely ruin her reputation in politics. Thus, she is seemingly left with only a few choices. She could greatly slash government spending, but this is also a decision that would not be without political backlash, as much of the UK's workforce is at their breaking point and are likely to strike if made any more unhappy. It seems that the entire political landscape of the UK is shifting, with support for the opposing Labour Party up to nearly 22 points over the Conservatives in just the past two weeks. Truss absolutely must navigate the current windstorm swiftly and effectively if her political reputation is to survive. More importantly, if she fails in leading the nation through to the other side of this situation, it is quite possible that the UK will be set back far enough that it could take decades to return to its former glory. Truss has reversed some of the more radical tax cuts and spending ideas since the initial release of her plan, but the markets have yet to fully return to trusting her government's increased spending habits or the overall economy of the United Kingdom. Without drastic shifts in her and her government's policies and overall ideas, 
Trust risks not only her party's demise, but the demise of one of the most rugged, trustworthy financial markets of all time. The nation that's historically known for its massive free trade activity and mercantilism is running the risk of being unable to adapt to the shifting landscape of the global economic system and could find itself without a place to fit in once the final waves settle from the 2020 pandemic. Only time will tell the future of the UK, but without extremely well thought out, calculated action and a humbling of egos across the government, it's clear that the UK and most of Europe along with them risk being relegated to second-class nation status. What do you think? Does the United Kingdom have the ability to pull themselves out of the dire economic situation they currently find themselves in? Or will devastating financial repercussions overcome the nation and send an economic ripple effect throughout the rest of Europe and the world? What would you advise the Prime Minister to do if you were given the opportunity to speak with her and her cabinet? And what effects do you think a UK demise would have on the global economy, specifically the economy of major UK allies such as the United States? Please let me know in the comments. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe for more.